Eh, muchas gracias, Alberto, por la presentación. Eh, bueno, aparte de, darle las bien, aparte de darles la bienvenida, quería eh, comenzar comentando un poco eh, de dónde sale la iniciativa de estas charlas. Eh, yo soy coordinador de posgrados de la Escuela de Ingeniería Mecánica de la Universidad Industrial de Santander y formo parte de la Red Colombiana de Investigación en Fatiga y Fractura, que pues, ha nacido recientemente como una iniciativa para encontrar espacios comunes de investigación entre la universidad y las empresas. Allí en la diapositiva pues, ustedes ven eh, una imagen de los, de los participantes en esta red eh, eh, con, un, con un fuerte balance entre la, el desarrollo de, de, de teoría y estudio académico y eh, la contraparte industrial que pues, finalmente son los que están llamados a aprovechar estos avances y esta, este proceso de apropiación tecnológica. En particular, en la Escuela de Ingeniería Mecánica de la UIS, hemos tratado de incentivar este tipo de, de actividades. Eh, las redes de colaboración, eh, todo eh, dirigido a, por un lado, pues mejorar los, los, los indicadores de investigación de, de nuestra región, pero también a realizar ese proceso de transferencia que tanto hace falta en el tejido productivo. Eh, el día de hoy pues vamos a iniciar este ciclo de conferencias como, comenzaba Albert, como comentaba Alberto eh, con un, un investigador muy cercano a nosotros, eh, eh, Sundar Natayara, que es eh, profesor asistente del Instituto Indio de Tecnología en Madras. Él trabaja eh, junto con otro grupo de investigadores en el Legato Team eh, y en particular pues lo, a través de de la escuela, hemos realizado la gestión para dar comienzo a esta red de conferencias eh, de la red colombiana de fatiga y fractura. Entonces, pues es para nosotros un placer tener aquí el día de hoy a, a Sundar. Él nos va a eh, comentar aspectos referentes a la mecánica de la fractura y cómo se está tratando este tema desde el ámbito computacional o mediante el uso de métodos numéricos. Eh, antes de comenzar, pues hacer una presentación formal del, del conferencista. Él es eh, profesor asistente eh, desde el 2014 en la sección de diseño de máquinas del, eh, de las, del Departamento de Ingeniería Mecánica del Indian Institute of Technology Madras. Esta universidad es está clasificada entre las primeras 300 universidades del mundo y es la primera universidad en ingeniería en la India. Eh, pertenece a una red de universidades de alto desempeño académico y, eh, bueno, tiene un amplio reconocimiento en Asia. En particular, el profesor eh, Sundar Natayaran eh, es un investigador que tiene más de 135 publicaciones indexadas en Scopus, con un factor de impacto H-index de 34, y él ha estado dirigiendo su investigación en temas relacionados con mecánica de la fractura, en métodos numéricos avanzados para la resolución de este tipo de problemas, que es el propósito de la charla, aquí hablarán de XFEN, FaceField y otros similares, también tiene eh, publicaciones muy reconocidas en el ámbito de materiales compuestos y materiales funcional, funcionalmente graduados. En su experiencia, pues él estuvo trabajando varios años en, la, en General Electric, en la división de aviación, como ingeniero. Posteriormente eh, estuvo trabajando en Cardiff University, en la Universidad de New South Wales y en el Instituto, en el instituto Indio de Ciencia en Bangalore. Eh, con esto, pues, darle nuevamente la bienvenida, Sundar. It is very nice to have you here with us. Uh, I hope we, we can uh, continue our collaboration and uh, I can now give you your, your time for the speech. La presentación para los asistentes eh, se realizará en inglés. Eh, pueden activar el closed captioning de Google Meet, por eso escogimos esta herramienta. Y adicionalmente, si 
tienen dificultades en, en, en seguirla, también pueden activar la traducción de esos eh, subtítulos en, en el video, ¿de acuerdo? Entonces, bueno, con esto yo creo que ya podemos comenzar. Eh, Sundar, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm very much here. Can you see okay, me? So, okay, so now I'm going to start sharing my presentation and I'll give you uh, space to share yours and start with uh, the talk. Uh, on behalf of the Colombian Network of Practical Inspectors, we would like to thank you again, also uh, Universidad Industrial de Santander, and uh, we hope we can continue collaborating with your university in the near future. Thank you for accepting our invitation, and you can present now. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the great opportunity. And uh, I hope uh, everybody is safe and sound with your family uh, in this uh, pandemic situation. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Oh, okay. So uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity to present my work at uh, Columbia Network on Fracture and Fatigue. And uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to talk about uh, some of the research activities that I have been doing here at IIT Madras. Some of them have been um, started uh, during my PhD work. And uh, during the post art, something uh, else I picked up. Uh, so I'll be uh, giving a short overview of different uh, techniques that, uh, or methodologies that we are working on uh, for modeling fracture uh, in this talk. So let me start presenting my screen. Let me know if you're able to see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen now. Okay, thank you. So the title of today's talk uh, is gonna be on uh, recent advances in computational fracture mechanics. I am Sundarajan Nadrajan. I'm a faculty in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. And that's my recent picture, the picture that you saw and the invitation is quite old. And this is how I look now. Once again, thank you for the great opportunity. So this is where I am currently located. Actually, I'm in the south of India. And uh, hopefully, you know, pandemic situation um, becomes better and uh, hope to visit Colombia sometime. Uh, it's been a really long time. I think last time when I met Andres, that was, that was in 2018 at uh, WCCM in the US. So hope to... Uh, visit you uh, in the near future. So I'm going to start my talk by giving a quick overview of uh, Indian Institute of Technology. So this is uh, one of the premier institutions in India. This was established in 1959 and it's currently ranked number one in India. We have uh, around 550, 550 faculty members hosting around uh, greater than, more than 8,000 students. Uh, the, the beauty of this is this is that it's uh, amidst uh, a forest. So there is a 250 hectares of forest campus. So both campus, uh, the students and the faculty reside on campus. Uh, there's a nice picture of uh, the bee uh, on campus. Uh, we have nine engineering departments, uh, traditional departments like civil, mechanical, and electrical. We also have aerospace, chemical, computer science, engineering design, metallurgy, and ocean engineering. We also have nine other allied departments, applied mechanics, physics, mathematics, chemistry, humanities, and management studies. And I belong to uh, the mechanical engineering department where we have six research focus groups. We have, we are around uh, 65 faculty members with around 350 undergraduate students and a uh, little bit, little more over 500 master students, uh, which are basically an MTech students. And we also have little uh, over 500 research scholars. So we have two type of research programs here at IIT Madras. One is the traditional doctoral program. We also have masters of science by research uh, where the student is expected to do original research as a part of their master's program. And uh, there are six research groups, uh, advanced computational engineering, materials and design, manufacturing science and engineering, dynamics, acoustics and controls, energy science and engineering, and micro nano bioscience and engineering. Although I sort of fall into all the research focus group, my primary focus 
our affiliation is towards the first focus group, which is computational, computational engineering. We also have specialized centers uh, for rehabilitation devices, non-destructive testing, and also on combustion research, which is uh, number, which is like unique in India. So all said about my institute, uh, this is my uh, research group. Uh, we have a small nine member group with uh, one postdoc, couple of masters by student, master of science by research and the rest are uh, PhD scholars. Most of them uh, have graduated. So this is really a, a bit old picture now. But nonetheless, they are still active part of the research group. We are still working on some problems that uh, we started during their uh, work here at IIT Madras. And uh, before I start my presentation, I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, the first one is my uh, PhD supervisor, Stephen Bordes, uh, postdoc mentor, Chong Min Song, other collaborators from across the world, uh, Timon Rabzuk, Yanta Rui, Caroline Berg, Hung, Elena, and Antus who have been associated since uh, uh, we met in Cardiff in 2011, I believe, 2010. All right, so let me start my presentation by giving a research vision. Uh, you see three pictures here on this slide. The extreme left is, uh, you know, could be a melting or a solidification of an ice or water. The one that is at the center is uh, you know, a crack propagation, uh, either due to a static loading or a dynamic loading or a fatigue loading in uh, structural members or engine metals. The last picture on the extreme right is a picture about uh, showing how a flame propagates in in a in a fuel or in a combustible medium. Although they come from different physics of different physics, they you know depict different physics. There is one common uh, phenomena that is existing across these physics. The common phenomena is that there is an interface and this interface evolves in time, right? So if you look at the first example, there is a solid liquid interface which sort of evolves in time due to certain physics, governing physics. In the picture at the center, you have a crack, you have a crack phase uh, due to some external loads, this crack phase starts to propagate. So there is an interface that moves in time. The same applies to the last case also where there is a flame front which evolves or changes its shape uh, due to certain other conditions. So my research mission is, the, is to look at the centrality of a mathematical formulation across the discipline so that we can have an impact on variety of fields. So predominantly my focus is not specific to one class of uh, problems, say solid mechanics, but I look at general differential equation and see how I can solve them efficiently using computers. And in particular, I'm interested in looking at moving boundary or free boundary problems because they have wide applications in a variety of fields. For example, you can try to simulate uh, baking of a cake to a tumor growth. Uh, it could also be used for assessing damage in uh, complex structures. So my interest is to come up with common building blocks which can help us set, make progress in a range of disciplines. Okay? Although today, uh, my focus would be mostly on metals and how crack uh, growth can be modeled using some of the new techniques, but a similar framework can be adopted to other physics, for example. So computation mechanics, as we know, has revolutionized the design, so it can probe into areas where theoretical or experimental in investigations are difficult, so it is applied to civil, structural, biomedical, uh, it's also used in finance modeling. Uh, Unamic competition mechanics has a role to play now. And a typical framework uh, is what is shown here, is that let's say that you have a physical problem, and this physical problem is discrete in nature, and we try to understand what is going on with this physical problem. The way we do it is to get help from So we, we seek help of a mathematical modeling and observe the physical formula and convert that into a set of differential equations. And hope that by looking at the solution of the differential equations, we can interpret or understand the physical problem. For example, if I'm looking at the stresses in the turbine blade, 
I would pose this as a set of differential equation and then try to solve this differential equation to understand the response, for example, that is shown on the extreme right with a color counter plot. But the problem lies in solving this differential equation. So these differential equations are continuous form. And for complex structures, complex boundary conditions, uh, we, there is no way you can get a closed form solution. And that's when we go back and look at, uh, you know, use numerical techniques to solve these differential equations. And the primary goal of these numerical techniques is to convert these differential equations, which are in a continuous form, into a set of algebraic equations. And then we use algebraic, you know, say, concepts from linear algebra to solve for the numerical solution, right? Because we want to use computers to solve it and computers works with numbers. So uh, that's the reason why we do it. And there are a variety of methods which are currently in use, which help us solve these differential equations. And since all of them are approximation techniques, each have their own advantages and disadvantages. So I've listed some of them, some of them here, like finite elements, least square, finite volume method, spectral element method, boundary element method, collocation, finite difference, ritz galerkin and so on and so forth. And uh, of these, for solid mechanics problem, finite element is the most sought out because of its strong mathematical background, uh, its robustness, and that is uh, almost three decades of research that has gone into finite elements, which is now widely accepted uh, by industry also. You know, we have sophisticated commercial softwares, robust commercial softwares like Abacus and ANSYS, uh, the, the results of which can be trusted. But the whole idea is uh, we should keep in mind is that the role of numerical simulation is not to replace experimental observations, but to help understand what we observe experimentally, or to reduce the number of experiments that we would have to do, come up with a design, which you know is feasible. So if I want to pose this in a mathematical framework, you know, the governing equations are given by differential equations, like I said, you know, uh, differential equations. So where LU equal to L uh, equal to F, that's on the domain, L is some differential operator. And we invoke concept of uh, Galerkin, and then we try to write the equal and weak form for it. And then we try to find the solution, which is the approximate solution uh, in terms of some polynomials. So this is, this is the mathematical framework. And simple words, what we do is uh, we try to divide the region into smaller regions, right? So for example, if I'm trying to look at uh, some physics over a circle, I divide the circle into smaller regions. So the simplest region could be a triangle. It could also be quadrilaterals or polygons. Uh, but these have to be non-overlapping. Uh, for example, that is most uh, uh, used method. And by assuming the solution over each of these smaller regions, we can now construct the global solution. That's how it works. And the same idea also works in case of three dimensions where uh, you know the domain can be discretized or divided into non-overlapping elements. So the standard elements that are used in uh, three dimensions are tetrahedrals or hexahedral elements, where, which are six-sided or six-faced elements. And the typical process in uh, design is that you have a CAD model. And this CAD model is not suitable for analysis because this has complex shapes and then um, it's not suitable for analysis. So what we do is we spend a lot of time converting the CAD model to analysis suitable model. This process, we call it as meshing. And many times meshing is the most expensive uh, step in this whole process. And once you have the mesh, then you can adopt any of the previously set approaches to find the solution over this domain. And if, if it is not feasible, then you go back fixing the CAD model. And this is a typical uh, cycle for design evolution. However, finite element is very robust. You know, it's, uh, it's commercially acceptable. There are some setbacks with finite elements. Um, I've listed some of them here, which are more critical than the rest. Uh, for example, uh, the, the regions that we try to discretize have to be, uh, have to have some nice qualities, properties of it, you know, 
the the foremost property is that the elements cannot be concave for example uh, it doesn't allow uh, elements to have concave regions because then the finite element breaks down or it cannot have very long elements which uh, you know loses some good approximation properties although we may start with the good quality element because uh, of the of the theoretical framework uh, for example if you are trying to solve a large deformation problem we may end up with elements which are badly shaped and uh, and then the analysis breaks down so we have to stop the analysis do something called a remeshing and then start the analysis again so that is a bottleneck in if you are trying to use finite elements and um, the other uh, problem with finite element is that it requires uh, you know confirming mesh to represent internal boundaries and uh, since we are using polynomials to represent the solution if there is a if there is a sharp gradient or a singularity finite elements you know sort of struggles to represent it and we need extremely refined mesh close to the singularity for example you can see there is a red uh, mesh here where the mesh is really fine uh, which is required to capture the singularity there and also uh, you know you need to have a confirming mesh for example the black lines could be uh, a representative grain for example if you are talking about uh, polycrystalline materials and uh, you need to have a mesh that sort of conforms to these grains and if these grains start to change shapes or evolve i would have to update my finite element mesh mesh which sometimes could be uh, a not a trivial task to do the last of the difficulty uh, that i mentioned here is to do with geometry representation uh, because we use linear uh, we use polynomials to represent it and many times polynomials are not good at representation of actual engineering structures for example if you have really complicated shapes like this you can see that uh, you know the the geometry is not exactly represented and this introduces errors in your simulation and as a stress analysis we should be aware of these pitfalls of the finite element method but this also has opened up a lot of research in trying to improve finite element method right and uh, finite element method has also been used to understand material failure so material failure could be uh, an advantage or a disadvantage so in this slide i'm trying to uh, showcase where it is not beneficial to have a material failure and uh, it's so important to understand when and how a material would fail and if you are able to predict it it's going to save uh, you know a lot of uh, i mean you know, monetary benefit it will also save a lot of uh, i mean huge human life um and in this case understanding damage mechanisms can help us design a structure which is damage tolerant so we can avoid certain failures uh which uh, you know are otherwise inevitable of course understanding damage mechanisms also help us um, you know come up with a better tool design so that we know what tool to use uh what uh, uh, to to manufacture certain component right because we should be able to remove materials or you know drill holes in uh, in certain materials for which we need to understand how uh, the the uh, damage mechanisms uh at up here in certain materials so a conventional finite element method would require like i said earlier uh, a confirming mesh so here i'm showing uh, two examples uh, the one on the extreme right where you see a red line this could represent a, for example a crack and let's say this uh, is subjected to some loading it could be a tension or some uh, some fatigue loading if we were to use finite elements every time the crack moves we would have to update the mesh um, which could be not a trivial task especially if you are talking about uh, multiple cracks especially in uh, three dimensions this is an example of a uh, typical example where it could be a phase change problem so like you know what we seen in a solidification problem where you have two uh, different phases and then this orange line depicts the the interface of these two phases and with with the uh, change in time the shape of the interface changes and if you were to use finite elements uh, we would have to update the mesh every time it uh, changes and updation is not the only key we would also have to 
port the information from the previous mesh to the new mesh for subsequent analysis, which may introduce certain errors in the simulation. And like I said, this has opened up a lot of research activities to come up with efficient uh, techniques to model these uh, moving boundary problems uh, with finite elements. Yeah? And in, uh, like I said, in this talk, I'll focus more on fraction mechanics. Uh, there have been a lot of work on uh, improving or using finite elements to solve crack, crack root problems in materials. Uh, the first one is based on uh, remeshing finite element, the one that we saw in the earlier, in the earlier slide, where the mesh is updated every time the crack grows in time or changes shape. Right? Um, early or late 2000, early 2000, late 1990s, uh, there was this uh, method that was introduced called the extended finite element method, which is now also available in Abacus as an add-on, which the beauty of this method is that it doesn't need a confirming mesh to capture the crack growth. So the crack can independently grow uh, on a background mesh, right? So that is the beauty of it. There is also this formulation called peridynamics, which works on integral formulation, which is also currently being heavily researched on to model fracture growth. And uh, late 2000, uh, there has been this idea of using phase field method, which is uh, originally used for modeling uh, phase change materials. Uh, now people are trying to use phase field models to model crack growth in materials. Right? And in today's talk, I will focus on um, three topics, uh, extended finite element method, uh, I'll briefly touch upon uh, a method called scale boundary finite element method, which has some nice advantages. And lastly, I'll touch upon phase field method um, to show. So uh, the first of the topic is going to be on extended finite element method. So this comes under a bigger umbrella of uh, methods called partition of unity method. And here the idea is to detached geometry and analysis. Remember we talked about finite element method requires a confirming mesh. So now the, here the whole idea is that, uh, is it possible to come up with a method where the geometry can be independent of the mesh? And that's how the final, uh, that's how the X from the works. So uh, the basic idea was, um, uh, excuse me, is there a question? No, no, you can continue as in there. Okay. So the objective of this is that if I have an interface, for example, a circular interface or some flower shaped interface or, or a crack so shown by a solid black line, is it possible to represent them independent of the mesh? Not only really represent them, but I also capture the, the underlying physics, uh, which is uh, without the mesh that conforms to it, right? And conventional finite element would require that you need a confirming mesh. For example, if I'm trying to solve the crack problem, I need to have singular elements which are aligned to the interface and you also need to have extremely refined mesh close to the crack tip so that you can capture the singularity. Remember finite element works with simple polynomials and polynomials are not really good in capturing the singular functions. Although if it is a static crack or a static interface coming up with a mesh is not a problem even in three dimensions but the real problem comes when you have these uh, interfaces that start to change shape or evolving time. And this becomes computationally expensive if you are talking in terms of three dimensions or if you have like multiple cracks, right? Or multiple holes or inclusions. And conversion finite element method would have to differentiate uh, a hole and an inclusion. Whereas in X firm, they can be treated in a unified way by just using appropriate uh, and sorts or enrichment functions, which you will see in a couple of slides coming from now. And it, it, it's very robust in that sense. It can also model crack growth. It can also have these cracks coalesce, branch, you know, it can do all sorts of things with a mesh that doesn't update every time. All right. So when do we need enrichment technique? So we need enrichment techniques when you have discontinuities in your model, for example, cracks or metal interfaces. If you have large gradients like yield lines or shock waves, or if you have singularities, for example, not just cracks, or if there is a re-entered corner, or if there is a boundary layer in your problem, like it, you know, it could be a fluid solid or a fluid fluid interactions. Or if you have 
uh, solution is highly oscillatory. For example, if you're trying to solve the Helmholtz equation and looking at uh, you know mid frequency or uh, high frequency problems, where the solution is highly oscillatory, and we know that the typical number of elements that is required to capture is that you need at least ten elements to capture the wavelet. So now, if I'm looking at a uh, really high frequency, my computational expense just uh, grows exponential. But by using XFM, we can, uh, you know, we don't have to use such a highly refined mesh, but still capture the essential physics of the problem. And the basic idea is that we will add uh, certain functions to finite time basis that can capture the necessary physics. Okay. And the basic idea behind that would be to uh, improve the convergence rate because when you use finite elements to solve these problems, the optimal rate of convergence uh, reduces by one half for certain cases. So we would want to retain optimal order of convergence with finite elements at the same time capture uh, the necessary physics with, with a mesh that doesn't conform to the job. That's a whole objective. Um, so this is one example how people try to model cracks. For example, uh, they use uh, what is called a quarter point element, which is a special case of an eight noded serendipity element where uh, they place the crack tip on one of the nodes, corner nodes, and they move the mid side node to one quarter of a distance from the crack tip. And by doing this, we can capture the, the singular, uh, the similarity that uh, is present at the crack tip. Uh, but this works for isotropic homogeneous material, but for other cases, you know, it doesn't really work that efficiently. So that is also one reason why the why there has been a lot of research in uh, coming up with methods that can capture the, the physics of the problem. For example, if it is a, a, a bimaterial interface and then you have a crack uh, between those interfaces, uh, the singularity is, uh, is complex. So, you know, uh, this sort of an arrangement does not work in favor of that. <laughs> so again, like I said, there has been a lot of work uh, in trying to improve finite element method, uh, and I've classified them um, into three categories. They all come under a uh, category called enrichment techniques. So one is called a local enrichment, global enrichment, and there is something called a mesh, mesh overlay techniques. All the basic idea in all of these is to have uh, a method where I can model these um, cracks or discontinuities independent of the mesh, right? And in this talk, I'm going to focus only on X1, um, although the same uh, sort of a framework can be uh, talked in terms of generalized finite element method or elemental enrichment techniques and other techniques. Okay, so the basic idea in X1 is that you have the standard finite element basis function and to it, you add certain functions that carry the necessary information of the problem, right? So we don't know a priori what these functions are, but I know that if I can put in these functions, I can capture the physics of the problem. So for example, the first term, which is uh, shown in blue color, that's a standard approximation for your for unknown field. The one that is shown as PU enriched is the new function that we are going to add to the standard finite element basis. So here phi j's are standard finite element functions. Psi i's are the, are the functions which carry the necessary local information of the problem. So if I'm trying to solve a wave problem, psi of x could be some sines and cosines, which represent the wavy nature. Uh, for a different set of problems, you know, psi ha will take a different form. So now you can already see that by just changing psi of x, we can try, we can solve different class of problems, uh, which a finite element method cannot do it because finite element method is restricted to use only polynomials. But now here with this addition of psi of x, I have more freedom in choice of the functions. And the function choice will depend on the type of problem that we are trying to solve. So now, if, now that we are adding new functions, we also have to, uh, since we are using Galatkin framework, we also have additional unknowns to solve for. And uh, the rest of the process is going to be very similar to a standard Galatkin framework. Uh, we put that into the weak form, we compute your stiffness matrix and the force vector. But the only change now here is that uh, because of this additional 
uh, set of functions that we have added to the approximation function, the stiffness matrix now has an enlarged form, right? So it can be seen as a block form where the first block corresponds to the standard part, the, the last block corresponds to the enriched part, and then you have this coupling because there is an interplay between the standard and the enriched part. And by solving these, you know, you can now uh, find the coefficients and then plugging it back, you can find the solution. And uh, based on the choice of the enrichment function, the solution is now is going to be uh, enriched. And that's the reason why these are called enrichment techniques. So this is how it works. So you see the standard um, a final element basis function that is shown for a four nodal quadrilateral element on the right, on the left. You can see that at most it can only capture a hat type of a, pro, a hat type of a function, right? You can reproduce a hat type of a function. So what we do in XFEM is that we take this hat function, multiply, let's say some some function g of x to get a new function, which now you know you can see that it is uh, it is complex than your hat function. Right, so the choice of G of X is where we have a room to play, and uh, depending on the type of the problem, we will choose a particular G of X. So we can use the same mesh. Depending on the choice of G of X, I can solve a crack problem or or a problem with a void or an intrusion. It doesn't matter. So I can have the same mesh for all class of uh, problems. Right. The way it works is that uh, you would have to uh, sort of represent these interfaces implicitly, right? Because now we are talking about a method where the interfaces are not represented uh, explicitly. So we need to have a technique by which you can represent them. And typically we use level sets to represent the interface. And uh, once we know what sort of problem that we are trying to solve, we need to identify the choice of an enrichment function. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, depending on the type of the problem, for example, if it is a vague problem, the functions could be, um, you know, sines and cosines or some exponential basis. If it is a crack problem, we'll see what functions that we use. So this is the choice of enrichment function is completely upon us. So depending on the problem, we will we can change. And uh, we also have to identify the regions that we want to enrich. For example. Uh, if it is a wave problem, we don't have a choice. We have to enrich the entire space because wave can go through the entire domain. But if it is a crack or an interface problem, you know we know that uh, the deformation or the influence is going to be very local. So we don't want to be enriching the entire space, whereas we uh, instead we would want to enrich it locally. And to be able to do that, we need to identify the nodes where we have to enrich it. The other difficult or the other thing that we have to worry about in X fun is that since we are adding these new functions which are not necessarily polynomials and uh, you know they are represented implicitly, numerical integration of the weak form is not going to be a trivial task. And typically what is done is that we use uh, triangulation to uh, sort of find the integration points and complete the bilinear form. Uh, but it is noted that these triangles or subtriangulation do not add additional degrees of freedom. They are just there to locate integration points such that the integration points do not lie on the interface uh, so that you are able to compute the weak form uh, numerically. All right. So let's talk about how do, how do we represent a crack independent of the mesh. So crack has, for example, if I'm talking about linear elastic fracture mechanics, crack has two distinct features. One is that there is a singularity at the crack tip. You know, the functions, the, the stresses go to uh, infinity as you approach the crack tip. And behind the crack tip, you have a jump in the displacement. So these are two different physics that I would like to capture. And if you're using finite elements, one that is represented by the black standard part, since the function ni of x, those are the basis function, they are continuous function, they cannot represent either the crack tip singularity or the jump in the solution, right? And to be able to model this, we add two set of enrichment functions here. One that can capture the jump. So these functions are restricted to regions behind the crack tip and one set of functions which can represent the singularity. So which is ahead of the crack tip. 
and by doing this we can now capture the necessary physics of the problem without having to update the mesh now if we have let's say a hole or an inclusion in the problem we can add additional enrichment functions that will carry the necessary information so uh, to represent the jump behind the crack phase all we have to do is add what is called a heavy side function so the derivative of this the function itself is discontinuous and the derivative does not exist so you can capture the jump the the functions that we use to represent singularity you know comes from analytical expansions for example uh, there are billiam expansions and other techniques which we can use them as uh, enrichment functions and sometimes if uh, and the solutions are not available uh, what we can do is to do one set uh, uh, you know overkill finite interval method and then use that solution as an enrichment function for subsequent analysis this greatly uh, you know saves computation effort everything is nice but there are some difficulties with xn is uh, like i said you know integrating these complex functions are not going to be a trivial task and uh, it it poses some challenges however by now uh, you know we know how to uh, sort of work around these complex functions to do it but nonetheless these are some things that we have to uh, keep in mind when we are trying to implement xn in this the other difficulty is that when we are using local enrichment functions uh, there would be regions where uh, the nodes are completely enriched there would be regions where the nodes are not enriched but there will be regions where they are partially enriched and these are called blending elements in xfm literature and the problem with, with blending elements is that the solution is not represented accurately in those elements and this leads to uh, poor convergence rates and uh, you know some uh, problems with the solution again now it is all handled uh, very nicely so we don't have any blending problem the other difficulty is that the conditioning number of uh, of xm uh, you know grows exponentially because of these addition of uh, enrichment functions so care has to be taken such that the the functions that we add to finite term basis are not linearly dependent on the standard finite term basis function so if they are linearly dependent we end up with a system uh, which are linearly dependent and then your condition number goes up you will not be able to solve the system and lastly you know since we are adding additional functions we have additional unknowns now the price to pay here is that we would have to solve an enlarged system as supposed to just solving uh, for the standard degrees of freedom but again there is a trade off between that um, when compared to finite term method which we will see in some of examples where finite term method conversion finite term method breaks down whereas x form has a clear advantage in this so the advantage of uh, x form is the following the, the one that you see on the top top uh, animation is what we saw earlier which is conventional finite term method what we see in the bottom figure is what we can achieve using extended finite term method i can assure you that none of them are uh, you know animated or uh, you know they are they are coming from real simulation as i can you can see that uh, you know i don't have to update the mesh every time the crack grows in time or the the topology changes or the interface changes in time so that's an advantage with x right so we have applied this to uh, many benchmark problems uh, one of the standard or classical problem is uh, It's an experimental prob, experimental test case where you have a, a three-point bent specimen with three holes, and there is a crack of length a, which is at the distance of d from the center line where the load is applied. And depending on the distance d, um, the crack would either go into the first hole, the bottommost hole, or it would bypass the first hole, go and merge into the second hole. And uh, it this is computationally very uh, challenging to capture this because you need to have an extremely refined mesh if i am using a finite term method to do it and uh, and you also have to update the mesh every time the crack grows and what you see on the right you know the right, uh, red line and the, so, the purple line are the crack growth from the experiments and we try to solve this using xfm 
uh, you know, that's the animation that you would see. So this is a case where the distance is such that it uh, sort of bypasses the first hole and then goes and merges into the second hole. So as, you can see, as you can see, there's a good correlation between experiments and the numerical simulation. And uh, I would like to bring it to note. Uh, you notice that the finite background mesh was not updated during the entire simulation. The only the, the regions which have to be enriched was updated, but the mesh remained the same. So uh, this is a uh, this is another example uh, which was done by uh, uh, a student with uh, Stephen Borders. Uh, this was uh, this was for an industry where they were trying to uh, look at how and when the fracture happens in the silicon vapor. So this was called a, a smart cut TM. So the basic idea is that you want to have a silicon wafer model where you want to uh, sort of etch the wafer, uh, and you would want to know when and what rate you can etch so that you know the wafer doesn't break. Right, so this is a complex uh, phenomena, and our objective in XFM was to understand or model microcrack nucleations, and uh, there would be multiple cracks which are happening, and these cracks may grow in time. They also can coalesce or branch out, and uh, we would want to study these patterns and how these crack grows. We would also want to find the time to complete fracture. And what is the final surface roughness? Because every time the crack grows, it creates a new surface, and we would want to see uh, what is the resultant surface. Because this crack growth is depending on the manufacturing process, so we would want to minimize the surface roughness. So if you are able to predict a priori what would be the surface roughness for a particular manufacturing process, we can go and then optimize the process by which you can then minimize the surface roughness. So. This has multiple regions. We have a silicon, then a damaged zone, and then some silicon wafer, and then silicon dioxide. Right? And uh, within the damaged zone, you have multiple cracks, and this is the region where you would sort of etch so that you get the wafer out. And to model this, we have used cohesive elements and linear elastic fracture mechanics uh, in combination with XOM because you will see that there are hundreds of cracks uh, when this. Um, is going to be etched and then these cracks can grow in time. So here is an animation of uh, of the process. So I'm going to stop here. So what you see here is a, is a small window of the entire specimen where all these white lines represent the crack, right? And this is now subjected to um, some load and there are some um, crack face loads that are also applied, which causes the cracks to grow. And uh, normally we would expect that uh, not all cracks grow at the same time. Some cracks grow and then stop because of the energy criteria. And then we are able to simulate that using x -Pan. So let the animation go. As you can see that the crack at the left mode started to grow it uh, start to merge with other cracks and then and then it stopped for a for a moment then it started to grow in the other direction and for the entire simulation the mesh was not updated uh, we kept the mesh the same uh, only the regions which have to be enriched have been updated and you can already see that although there are other micro cracks they do not actually participate in the crack path so this is uh, uh, this is a nice thing Although they're a micro crack, they don't necessarily become a macro crack, which may lead to essential failure. So we also have applied XFEM to uh, look at fracture in uh, laminated composites. So laminated composites have uh, typically two distinct um, uh, fracture behavior. One is uh, interlaminar delamination or, or fiber breakage, right? Or, or matrix tracking or fiber breakage. So this is a this is a experimental video where you have a composite plate. It's a laminated plate, and you have two slots. You know the black 
solid black line that you see on the on the image or the cracks and then this is subjected to far field tension so the, uh, you'll see that uh, it uh, the crack starts to propagate from this line and it fails in uh, in an instant and this is a typical quasi static uh, brittle failure i can see that at, at, at about this frame the crack um, you know just started and you can see that you're you're able to see there are some fibers that are also hanging out because of the the fracture that happened and our objective was to see if we can uh, use xfm to simulate this uh, this observation so those are the crack uh, which are growing along the crack fiber the fiber is along that direction and uh, since fiber is stiffer than a matrix you can see that the crack has grown along a particular uh, direction along the fiber direction so now uh, this can help us design structures where we can optimize the the layout of the fibers such that if if at all there is a crack or a discontinuity it can um, you know sort of delay the fracture process so you can engineer the uh, the fiber orientation such that the crack takes a longer time to grow which implies that we can increase the life of the copper right so but to be able to use xfm to do it we had to come up with a new set of enrichment functions because the isotropic enrichment functions that we were using for isotropic material we are not able to capture the necessary physics because it it uh, failed to have this uh, information of the fibers in the model so we had to come up with new functions uh, so these are the new functions where g of theta or g1 of theta g2 of theta has the necessary information of the fiber orientation and um, so we are able to see that uh, you know we are able to model uh, the crack growth in uh, in this orthotropic material using xfm and that closely matches with experimental results so these are other configurations that we had model that the fiber is oriented along the one direction and in this case uh, for a, for a uniform tension the crack is expected to grow um, you know straight as expected uh, for the other direction you can see that um, the crack goes along the direction of fiber the one uh, exception of this is when the crack is oriented uh, perpendicular to the crack experiments show that there is a uh the branch and that happens at the crack tip which uh the xfm was not able to capture it uh, that is because crack branching has to be an input to the model so that you know it knows when the crack has to branch so uh of course when we did the simulation back in 2011 we didn't have that necessary information so that's the reason why it was predicting predicting that the crack grows along one direction and not in two directions as we see in experiments i think that's the last slide on uh, on xfm uh, so are there any questions or i can move on with uh, with the next part of the talk <laughs> sundar um okay so we have two questions so far uh, the first one is uh, related to what kind of software are you using to model uh, these uh, slides the the problems uh, shown in these slides so we have developed our in-house codes uh, some of them are in matlab some of them are in c++ they are also available in our uh, github uh, source page uh, i can share the link with andres uh, who can share it with you guys uh, we also have implemented this in abacus but by the time we implemented abacus also has its own uh, uh, module on xfm but all the simulations are based on in-house codes okay and also uh, one attendee is asking uh, your opinion regarding the virtual element method for fracture mechanics can you repeat that question uh, somebody wants to know uh, somebody wants to know your opinion regarding a uh, vab virtual element method vm yes uh, in fact we have uh, we have started to look at enriched virtual element method so i see virtual element method as a way to compute the bilinear forms 
leaving aside these discontinuities or anything in an efficient way without having to worry about the, the shape and the size of the element. It still uses polynomials to represent the unknown fields, uh, which is still a problem if you're trying to use uh, to model crack problems or in interface problems. Uh, of course, the research is uh, in a very slow process. There is one paper by Sukumar and others where they have tried to model a crack in a scalar problem, uh, but I think there is a still a long way to go doing it. But I think the research has really picked up using a phase field method, which is a really a hot topic now. Okay, uh, the same person, I think it's Jorge, is asking uh, if you know information about the matrix material in the carbon composite that you show in the, in the simulations. It's an, it's an a standard per pack, I suppose. I assume that we don't have your audio. We lost your audio, Sundar. Can you hear us? Sundar? Yeah, I think we lost the audio. I'm going to write to him. Hello? Yes, yeah, Sundar. Yeah. I can yeah, hear sorry. you now. Yeah, it, uh, it kicked me out. I don't know why. Okay. So, somebody. Now? Okay, so um, a couple of uh, more questions. Somebody is asking okay. if you know the, the matrix material for the composite, for the carbon composite that you are showing there. The matrix material is epoxy that we have used. Okay, so it's a standard prepack. Yeah. And, and the last question to continue, uh, how can XFN be used, uh, how can XFN be used for plate fixation methods in femoral bone fracture? Which dynamic failure model to be used for titanium alloys uh, regarding the fixation, uh, uh, regarding the crack? Okay, so, XFEM is, uh, <clears throat> is a numerical technique which allows us to model these cracks independent of the background mesh. How the crack grows, when grows, in what direction, when it has to coalesce, when it has to branch, what sort of a damage criteria that we have to use, or these are all inputs to the method. It has nothing to do with XFEM itself, right? So that, that is a different uh, area by itself where what sort of uh, criteria that I have to use to model the, you know, the crack growth. In these cases, what we have used is a maximum stress criteria, uh, which sort of uh, was okay in, uh, in, for these materials and these experiment simulations. But in, for a general case, yeah, those have to be um, known a priori as to what to use. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sundar. I think we can continue to the next part of the conference. Oh, thank you. So the next part of my talk is going to be on scale boundary fine determinant method. So I'm going to be very brief on this method because there is a lot of math involved, but I'd just like to uh, touch upon the benefits of the method without going into much of the details of it. Right? So here the idea is uh, you can reduce the dimensionality of the problem, right? So you can see that it has boundary, it also has fine determinant method. And uh, if you have guessed it, yeah, it's right. So it has a combination of the techniques that we use in boundary element method, and it has the advantages or the techniques uh, that we use in fine element method. And scale, you know, we'll try to understand as we move along with the method. So a brief on what this method is. So this was originally developed for soil structure interaction problems. Uh, the first paper appeared in 1997. It's a semi-analytical procedure. 
And since then, it has been applied to several other fields such as fractal mechanics, fluid mechanics, fluid structure interaction, uh, acoustics, electromagnetisms, and uh, very recently polytopes. And this was extended during my postdoc at UNSW. Uh, the beauty of this is that only the boundary is discretized, which implies that uh, you know the the volume need not be discretized. So that is a major plus point. And since it's only boundary is discretized, it looks like a boundary element method, but uh, it doesn't require the beauty of this. It doesn't require any fundamental solutions like a boundary element method. So it implies that I can directly apply this to a material nonlinearity problem or a geometric nonlinearity problem without without any difficulty. And it also works really nice if you are looking at infinite domain problems where the boundary conditions and the affinity can be uh, exactly uh, satisfied, right? Because it's uh, semi-analytical in nature. So here's a conceptual comparison between a finite element and boundary element method. So here I've taken the same example. Uh, I would like to model a crack, an edge crack problem with finite element method. Uh, you can see that the mesh has to conform to the, the crack, you know, which is at the at the middle. Of course, the mesh is not fine enough, but this is a, a schematic representation of, of what a fine element method would require. Boundary element method, on the other hand, would discretize only the boundary of the domain, and it uses Green's function, a fundamental solution, to represent the solution inside the domain. So the the benefit or the boundary element method requires this Green's function, which sort of is a disadvantage when trying to apply to a general class of problems. Whereas a scale boundary is a combination of that, combination of both. So like boundary element method, it discretize only the boundary. And like finite element method, it does not require a fundamental solution. So that's how it works. So here are some of advantages. Uh, it reduces spatial dimension by one, like boundary element method. It uses analytical solution inside the domain. It does not require fine, fundamental solution like finite element method. Uh, it does not require the material interfaces to be discretized, which is cannot be done in either finite element or boundary element method. Uh, the beauty of it is that the resulting stiffness matrix is symmetric and positive definite like finite element method. Whereas in a boundary element method, uh, if you're not using special techniques, it becomes uh, unsymmetric matrix. And uh, if you're trying to look at structure, I mean, fraction mechanics problems, um, we can compute the stress intensity factor in a straightforward manner without having to go through the, you know, the J integral route or a virtual crack closure technique approach. And uh, it can be seamlessly integrated with finite element method. That's the beauty of it. You know, if you have an existing finite element code, you can directly, uh, with, with a very minimum modification, we can make the code to uh, be a scale boundary code, and then you can solve some nice problems. With it. All right. So the basic idea with scale boundary is that you you work with a different set of coordinates. All right. So you start by defining uh, a new set of coordinates called the scale boundary coordinates, and this coordinate is situated inside the domain. And the criteria is that from the coordinate you are able to see the entire domain. Okay. So and uh, on the boundary, we use finite elements to discretize or represent the boundary. Right? And now I can go from this coordinate to the boundary by just scaling. So for example, if I represent the coordinate uh, you know, from the origin O to the boundary as psi, which goes from zero to one, uh, by changing the value of psi, I can go from the coordinate zero to the boundary. And that's why it's called the scale boundary coordinate, scale boundary finite method. Uh, it's finite element method because on the boundary it is finite element method. Of course, we also have applied, uh, you know, for example, isogeometric analysis because the CAD software gives only boundary information. And if you were to use an isogeometric analysis framework, we need to have volume information. That becomes uh, quite a challenging task. But if we use scale boundary finite element method or scale boundary technique, we can directly use the CAD model for analysis because CAD gives boundary information and scale boundary requires only boundary information for solution. So this is sort of nice thing that uh, you know we can work on. 
So the rest of the uh, formulation is going to be very straightforward. We transform uh, the displacements. We also transform the strain to these new coordinates. We plug that back, all of them into um, the virtual work. And that gives us to a stiffness matrix, which looks exactly similar to a fine diamond matrix. But here, the beauty is that these integrals are going to be only on the boundary of the domain. Nothing. So that we lost Tavi again. If I have a domain with a crack, all we have to do is to place this coordinate uh, origin at the crack tip and then sort of scale to the entire boundary. And since we are representing the solution inside the domain using analytical expressions, analytical functions, these analytical functions carry the necessary information of the problem. So we don't need to know a priori what is the strength of the singularity whereas the singularity comes as an outcome of the solution. So that's the beauty of the method. And it helps us capture or rather uh, compute the, the stress intensity factor, not only stress intensity factor, but also T stress and M stress and so on and so forth, which could be uh, uh, you know, essential for certain materials. So this is one uh, classical example where you have a plate with an inclined crack uh, of length 2a and it's subjected to far field tension. If you look at a fine diamond mesh, you will see that the mesh has to be extremely fine, close to the crack tip. Whereas in scale boundary, the one that you see at the middle is all what you require to solve the problem. So first of all, you can immediately see that the number of degrees of freedom is going to be extremely small. So the solution is going to be super fast. You can also you know, use your laptop and just run the model. You know, it's it's that efficient. In terms of accuracy, uh, you can you know you can see that uh, the stress intensity factor K1 and K2 are very close to what is reported in the literature, right? And this has also been compared with boundary element method. You know, it gives very uh, similar results to boundary element method. But here, I'd like to emphasize that uh, the uh, uh, it doesn't require uh, a Green's functions to do it. But the catch here is that if this crack starts to evolve, uh, this sort of a scaling requirement with, with where I said from the origin, I should be able to see the boundary uh, sort of vanishes. So to be able to do it, we again sort of discretize the domain into smaller regions and over these smaller regions, we can uh, you know, use scale boundary to do it. So here is one example where um, you know, we don't have to have a structured grid. We can digitalize the domain with polygonal elements. And uh, you can sort of capture the crack growth using scale boundary with the minimum effort as compared to a fine grid map. Of course, here I'm not comparing with the XFEM, but uh, this is a comparison with, uh, with the conventional fine grid map. So that's sort of a quick overview of uh, scale boundary method. I should also here point out that um, it's still not applicable for three-dimensional crack growth problems. There is still a long way to go if you're able to model that crack in three dimensions. Because this scaling requirement um, you know, is it's tricky in three dimensions because it doesn't boil down to a point. It boils down to a line, which sort of, uh, you know, we're still trying to come up with with the transformation which can um, you know, transform the coordinates such that you are able to use scale boundary technique to do it. So, but if you are talking about two dimensional problems, I think scale boundary uh, you know, is, is, is more sufficient than any of the techniques that are available. And it's more accurate for, uh, for a given degree of freedom. And you can actually run it on a, on a desktop uh, with let's say a two or a four GB RAM and you'll get 
accuracy, very high accurate results. Yeah. Are there any questions before I move on to the last part of the talk? Uh, yes, Sundar. Okay, uh, this is related to XFAN again. Yep. Maybe Garcia is asking if this XFAN approach could be extrapolated to materials degraded by temperature, like uh, cases when creep uh, is suspected. Yes, it can also be applied to uh, you know uh, to those problems, thermal problems or chemomechanic problems. Uh, in fact, when I was doing a PhD, there was another PhD student called uh, Alexander Bank. Uh, so his PhD was on uh, looking at thermomechanical uh, fatigue on uh, solder joints that are used in boards in the car. So where he has used uh, XFEM to look at how the cracks propagate and uh, what leads to final failure. So, yeah. so in short, yes, we can apply to uh, multi-physics problems. Okay, and also Sergio Munoz is asking if it is possible to model solidifying cracking as uh, seen in the casting and welding processes. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, if, it is, if it is possible to, modify, to model solidifying cracking as uh, the cracks that appear uh, when you are modeling casting and welding manufacturing processes. It is, okay. Uh, in principle, yes, but uh, you know, as we know, the the crack that form during solidification or welding are really complex, and uh, there are cases where the cracks uh, uh, sort of uh, coalesce or branch. So, if you are able to have that information uh, about when to branch or when to coalesce, yes, XFM can be used to do that also. But okay. for those problems, uh, currently I would suggest that phase fill method would be an ideal way to go about doing it because we just uh, submitted a paper where we had looked at uh, a coupled uh, thermomechanical problem where we look at how the fra cracks sort of evolve uh, when, uh, when a particular component is quenched. You know, it's heated up to a particular temperature and all of a sudden it is quenched in, uh, you know, uh, in a water bath. And then you'll see that there are micro cracks that are evolving because of uh, you know temperature gradient. And we try to use XFEM, but then there were difficulties. Then we switched to phase fill method, and that works really nice at this stage. Okay, thank you, Sundar. We can then move to the last part. Thank okay, you. thank you. All right. <clears throat> okay, the last part of the talk is going to be on phase fill modeling and uh, here this is a variation approach to fracture as opposed to the other techniques that we have seen earlier all right so the basic idea here is that um, so this can be classified under uh, a smeared or a diffuse crack model so there are two ways by which you can represent a crack one is a sharp crack uh, which can be represented discreetly you know either explicitly using conventional final dynamic method or implicitly using XFEM technique. Uh, in both the cases, you know that we need a criteria by which the crack grows and then we need to update the mesh. In XFEM, we need to have this knowledge of enrichment functions, which uh, for complex cases may not be available. You know, some cases, yes. Uh, but like I said, you also need to have a condition uh, for a crack to branch and coalesce. Um, if I have hundreds and thousands of cracks, XFEM, in my in my experience, has some difficulties. Okay. The other approach to model the cracks or diffuse crack, diffuse models uh, and uh, phase fill can be represent it can be thought of as a smeared crack or diffuse crack model. And here the basic idea is that the the total energy can be split into two energies. One is the bulk and uh, the surface because every time the crack is uh, evolved or uh, it's formed there is a new surface that is formed. And for the crack to grow, there has to be an energy that is spent to form this new surface. So this is the basic idea of Griffith, and that's how the fracture mechanics uh, came forward. And this bulk energy is a volume uh, integral, whereas uh, the, you know, the energy, the surface energy is a line integral or a surface integral. And what we do is we use gauss leverage theorem to convert that surface integral to volume integral, then you know you can then work with uh, a variational framework 
to use phase field model. So the basic idea in phase field is that uh, the crack can be represented or thought of as two different phases. The rather the region where there is no crack, we call that to be an undamaged state. And there is a region where there is a crack, which is a damaged state. And the transition between the damaged state and undamaged state is what we call as a phase field variable. And uh, typically it takes a value of zero to one. So zero implies it's undamaged, one it is completely damaged. Now the question is how do I go from zero to one? Right? So there are different ways by which you can do it. And uh, typically, you know, we use um, uh, an exponential to you know, sort of represent it. And uh, to be able to model, sorry, to be able to model the, the width of the crack, we have this parameter called L0 that sort of dictates how sharp or width wide the crack is. The larger the value, uh, the, the, the thicker the crack and the smaller the value, the sharper the crack is, right? So, and this uh, help us model, you know, different complex cracks. Uh, you know, it can have multiple cracks and they can have intersecting cracks and so on and so forth. And uh, the beauty of it is that it can uh, be readily extended to three dimensions. And uh, you can use your existing fine element code to model phase field modeling cracks. Yeah, sorry, the model crack using phase field methods. So uh, if you have looked at the, the earlier methods like XFORM or scale boundary method, there is some amount of work that has to be done uh, so that your code can adapt to it. But with phase field method, the beauty is that existing fundamental code, it could be a fundamental code or a mesh free in isogeometric analysis, it can be directly used to solve uh, the crack problems using phase field method. So, um, what we do is that we convert the, the surface integral into uh, the domain integral, and then we have this diffusion equation which sort of governs the, the crack evolution. And we have this bulk energy which we multiply with a degrading function because we need to separate out the region which are completely damaged to the region which are uh, undamaged. So we multiply with a function called a degradation function, which are represented using g of phi. And this has to satisfy certain conditions. So it has to be zero, oh, sorry, g of zero should be one when it is uh, no damaged and it should be one when it is fully damaged. And there are other conditions uh, with respect to the gradient, which are necessary from a mathematical point of view. So there are different degradation functions that are used in the literature. And this sort of dictates how fast you go from a damaged to an undamaged state. Um, you know, there are quadratic variations, there are uh, complex forms to it. Uh, the simplest one to implement would be the, the quadratic form, which is shown as a black line. So it takes a value of one at the crack tip, and it eventually goes to zero um, away from the crack. Yeah. But um, this quadratic function would lead to uh, you know, a sharp uh, a discontinuity at the crack. There are some pros and cons to it, and there is still a lot of debate going on as to what would be a suitable functions to use it. Um, yeah, that, that is still an open uh, question to be answered. So now the total potential energy can be written as given by equation six, where you have the first term is the bulk energy, second term is the energy coming from the phase field. Uh, we follow the same procedure, we take the variation with respect to the strain and also the phase field variable. So now you have to keep in mind now, we have to solve for the strain and also for this new variable called the phase field variable, which will dictate how the crack is going to evolve. And we follow the same variation framework, we end up with uh, governing equation, you know, the first equation is very similar if you ignore the, the factor, which is just the elasticity equation. Uh, so this equation is supplemented with a diffusion type equation, which is given by the second equation. Uh, GC is the fracture toughness, L0 is the crack, the phase field, the uh, uh, internal length, which sort of helps us model the crack. The, remember, the, the smaller the value, 
the sharp or the crack. And this is supplemented with boundary conditions as uh, before. And uh, so this is a coupled problem because the, the stress equation has a phase field variable and the phase field equation has this potential energy psi of epsilon. So to compute psi of epsilon, we need uh, the stress information. So, so this is a coupled problem. And one way to decouple is to introduce a new variable called a history variable, which sort of depends on the uh, strain information that is uh, present or that is uh, for a particular material point. Okay, so here is how it works. So we have to just use conventional finite element method to solve these two equations. You can write the weak form for it and then we can use traditional elements to do it. And uh, the, the point to note here is that the crack is not represented explicitly, but implicitly using the phase field variable. So I'm going to show you two examples, a classical example where uh, you have a square block with a crack of length 0.5, and this is a tension. And uh, there is another example where uh, the same square block with a crack subjected to shear. So in the first case, you will expect that the crack grows in a straight form until it reaches the external boundary. In the shear case, uh, because of the boundary conditions and the load applied, you will see that the crack sort of deviates, uh, uh, takes an angle and uh, goes to one of the bound, fixed bound. So, uh, so this is a, in a plot coming from the phase field equation uh, by solving it. Uh, what you show, what you see here is the, uh, the crack trajectory. So the, the red indicates that that's a crack. And what I'm showing is here is a phase field variable. So blue represents zero. So which implies the rest of the domain is not damaged at all. And uh, we sort of implemented that in our in-house code. And we compared that the results of the load displacement curve with uh, that's published in the literature. We are able to go, get some good uh, match. So in case of a shear, uh, if we use directly the phase field formulation that was put forth in, uh, in the earlier work, you see that the crack branches. And this is unphysical if you are talking about quasi-static crack uh, growth. And this was because the, the earlier model allowed the crack to grow also in the region where there is a compressive state of stress, which is not physical. So, and there has been a lot of work to avoid it. Um, you know, there have been um, approaches like uh, you know, additive decomposition of the, the strain into deviatoric and volumetric part. There has been uh, uh, decomposition based on eigenstrain, which sort of suppresses the crack to grow in the compressive region. And uh, so that, that's a formulation behind it where you uh, sort of update the history variable only with the positive side of it or only the tensile part of the energy. Whereas the negative side, if it is, uh, you, you just ignore it so that the crack doesn't grow in the negative side. So if you're if you are implementing it, uh, you know, you can then see that the crack uh, sort of grows only in one direction, which is what is uh, physical. Uh, again, we implement this in our in-house code and compare this with, uh, with uh, the results in the literature. We are able to get, get a good match. Uh, of course, sorry, this was implemented in Phoenix. Phoenix is an open source fine diamond software. Uh, we implement this in Phoenix and then you know, we are able to say get some good. All right, so all is nice with fine diamond method. It, it is uh, elegant in uh, modeling crack nucleation. It can also do crack propagation, branching. It can also uh, model multiple cracks. They can coalesce or branch out. All is fine, but the problem is that it requires a highly refined mesh to resolve uh, the necessary physics. Because of the uh, the variable L0, it requires a highly refined mesh. So what we sought out was to use local refinement techniques. And in particular, we wanted to use a scale bound refinement method, which has some nice features in terms of error indicators. And um, so that's how we started off this work. And um, we used SP, the error indicator coming from a scale bound refinement method to propose an adaptive phase field model, phase field method. 
Okay, I'm going to skip this part of it. So this is the basic idea of what the scale boundary method is going to do. So we introduce a new coordinate system, which is called scale boundary coordinate system from which the entire domain is uh, visible. Um, and all these equations are now converted to uh, the scale boundary equations. So we end up with a similar set of equations like finite element method, like we saw in the previous part of the talk. So I'm not going to go into the details of it, of the mathematics. I'd like, like to just highlight on the nice advantages that this method can uh, give us. All right, so scale boundary method, like we saw in the earlier uh, part of the talk, is that the solution inside the domain is represented analytically. Okay. So this gives us nice advantages because now I can use this information to, or use this information as an error indicator. Because what, what, the, what this analytical solution does is that it gives integers powers and some non-integer powers. So integer power represents that the solution is re represented exactly, whereas a non-integer power so means that the solution is not represented exactly. And uh, so it picks up those regions where the solution is not represented exactly and sort of refines this. So that's the basic idea of the error indicator in combination with this. And the way we do refinement is to start with a structured quadrilateral mesh and we use uh, quadri decomposition because it is the most efficient way to uh, divide the elements into, uh, or rather refine the elements locally. So I'm going to skip this part. It's just uh, telling you how to identify the regions using a scale boundary indicator. Uh, so here's a flow chart of it. So we start with, uh, with a mesh. We solve for the displacement. We solve for the phase field equation. Then we go and check if the uh, mesh has to be defined. If it is asked to be refined, we go and update the mesh, solve the problem again so that we attain some equilibrium. Uh, if um, it has, it need not be refined, then we go to the next load step and then this process continues until, you know, until we want to, we want to simulate it. All right. So here is the output of the, the simulation. Uh, this is the same problem, the shear problem. Uh, you can see that uh, we start with a very coarse mesh and uh, with the error indicator, you can see that the mesh is refined close to the region where the crack is evolving and uh, you're able to still capture the necessary physics, the crack growth uh, as what we have seen in the previous slide. And you can see that the rest of the domain where the damage is not expected, the, the mesh is really coarse. And uh, these are this is a typical quadri sort of refinement, which helps us, uh, you know, refine very locally, and uh, it's very efficient also. And this also works in three dimensions, where in sort of a quadri, it becomes an octree type of refinement. Uh, again, we have just submitted a paper on uh, on adaptive refinement in three dimensions. So here is an animation of how it works. I hope it works. So we start off with. Uh, with a very coarse mesh, again, uh, the, the red indicates that the material is damaged, the blue indicates the material is undamaged. This is uh, now subjected to shear, and you can see that uh, for a, until a certain point of load, it doesn't move. And uh, at a particular load, you can see that the elements are getting refined locally, and as it refines, sorry, as it propagates, the mesh is refined. I'll run it again so you can appreciate uh, how it works. So uh, by doing this, you can uh, we have saved a lot of computational effort because we don't have to refine everywhere, uh, which is what is required by conventional phase field method. So here is another example where I have multiple cracks. Again, we start off with a very coarse mesh and uh, we use uh, the error indicator from scale boundary to identify the regions that we have to refine it. And uh, you can see that the refinement happens locally. Of course, there is still some room for improvement where we can sort of uh, get rid of the mesh behind the crack tip. We are still working on it, uh, but in principle, 
you know, uh, you know, it works. So I'm going to run it again to for you to visualize how the crack grows. And this is a typical example where you know because of the the strength of the singularities, uh, you see that the crack sort of tries to go into each other, and the bend, the crack bends because of the singularity present uh, because of the other crack. So we also have tried it uh, with other uh, complex scenarios where you have a void, you have some matrix, you have some fiber. Uh, this is some manufactured problem. You know, the left end of the problem uh, domain is uh, restrained, whereas the right end you are subjecting it to a uniform tension. Right? And here there are no cracks to start with, but because there are singularities or concentrations, we expect that the crack would start at some location depending on the, the state of stress. And, um, you know, the phase field method can sort of capture that. So the initial mesh, we uh, started off with uh, 6,000 and odd quarterly elements. And we'll see how it works. So the crack started at the top, uh, the inclusion, and then it propagated all the way to the end. Okay, we are listening audio again. Wait a minute. All when compared to the standard phase field method. Of course, you may one may uh, immediately see that the width of the crack is smaller in uh, standard phase field method, whereas it is thicker in uh, in our proposed method. Uh, this can be controlled by increasing the number of elements close to the crack. Tip. Even then, the you know you can already see that there is at least two orders of magnitude difference. So we will still be computation efficient in uh, doing. It. I think that brings uh, to the last slide of my uh, talk. So in this talk, what I have done is presented the basic idea of XFEM, scale boundary fundamental method, and uh, phase field uh, modeling. Uh, we discussed with some standard benchmark problems in elasticity and linear elastic fracture mechanics. And uh, I'd like to conclude my talk by thanking once again uh, Andres and others for giving me an opportunity to talk in this uh, network, I'll be happy to take any questions. And uh, if you have any other questions or willing to, uh, I'm open for collaborations. If there is something that we can work on together, uh, you know, uh, send me an email. I've been, uh, you know, asking Andres that we should start working together again. Uh, once again, thank you for for your time. Okay, uh, thank you, Sundar. Thanks a lot for your presentation on the recent advances on fracture mechanics using computational mechanics. Uh, I, we have a couple of questions uh, more. Uh, uh, Fidel Romero is asking, uh, how can we introduce residual stresses, a profile of residual stresses on the models using XFEN or any other uh, technique that you just show us? So, uh, if I get the question right, so you're asking how do you model stresses in uh, XFEM framework or uh, phase field? Yes, yes, residual okay. stresses. Uh, so the residual stresses, uh, in the way we model would be same as what we will typically do in fundamental matter. Remember, again, these techniques are are not a, uh, are not going to eliminate fundamental method, but they are going to only uh, give you additional flexibility to fundamental method. So whatever approach that we have been using to solve certain class of problems can still be the same procedure can be used in these approaches also. Uh, does that yeah. answer? Uh, I think it's okay. Also, Sergio Munoz is asking if it is possible to model solid state transformations and its mechanical properties changes 
as the, for example, the martensitic transformation due to the strain in front of the crack tip in an austenitic steel. I, uh, I think I have uh, seen a paper which talks about how to use face fill model to model it. I personally haven't worked on those. Uh, uh, I mean, if you're interested, I can forward the paper to Anders and then he can communicate that to me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because uh, it been, uh, has been used to uh, simulate a modern state transformation. And that has been combined with the crack propagation also very recently. Very, it's a very recent paper. I can, I can share that with Andres later on. Okay, thank you. Also, Davy Garcia is asking, uh, what are the main limitations uh, of x scale boundary FEM, uh, et cetera, modeling uh, industrial problems related especially to complex geometry, simultaneous loading conditions, a response spectrum, random vibra vibration, and so on. Uh, mainly uh, limitations of the current approaches. Okay, so <clears throat> all these three approaches that uh, we discussed today are approximation techniques. So they have their own advantages and disadvantages. For example, if I talk about the phase field method, uh, like I said, we don't have to sort of modify the existing fine element code. I can still use the same fine element code, but I would have to solve two equations simultaneously to be able to model the crack growth problem. But the downside of that is that it's going to require you an extremely refined mesh to be able to capture the necessary crack path. Right? Uh, of course, there are some research going on as to how to improve that, but you know, that's, uh, I wouldn't, at uh, this time, yes, you can call that as a disadvantage, but uh, yeah, that can be worked upon. For scale boundary, um, like I said, it, a 3D crack growth problem is still a long way to go. Uh, but if it's going to be two dimensions, uh, I think it is better than phase field and external because the results are accurate. You can you can model them, um, you know, very efficiently. We have some papers on dynamic crack growth using scale boundary where we have shown that it's computationally efficient and accurate than XFEM or final dynamic methods. The beauty of a scale boundary in two dimensions is that you can also uh, handle uh, interface cracks, which are which are very difficult because uh, enrichment functions, if you are using final dynamic method, require complex enrichment functions. Uh, and those are very difficult to uh, implement and also integrate. Uh, XFEM, yeah, I mean, uh, it has come a long way. I would say it's been uh, two decades now. It has come a long way. It's, it's more robust now. Uh, but there are still some difficulties with it because the first thing is you would have to change certain structure of your code to be able to implement XFEM to it. Uh, criteria for crack growth, coalescence, and branching uh, are to be uh, an input to the model unlike uh, a phase field technique, because it is it is an outcome of the process. Um, and the difficulty with XFEM is that you need to know a priori uh, the enrichment functions. And, uh, and the other difficulty, what we uh, sort of uh, foresaw in the multiple cracks is that when you have two cracks very close to each other, the strength of the singularity is not root R anymore in uh, as what we see in isotropic material. Uh, and this overlapping of similar fields caused some convergence issues. Um, so we had to use some locally refined mesh so that the singular fields do not overlap each other. Yeah, there are some difficulties uh, with XFEM in those aspects also. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sundar. Uh, the last question. Uh, David Garcia also asks us uh, if these approaches are currently incorporated in any uh, commercial or industrial package. And, well, first that one. Okay, like I said, XFEM uh, is available in Abacus as a module. I think it's from version 6.8 or 9. It's available in Abacus. Uh, scenario, uh, a company, they have their own XFEM code, which I believe Andres knows about it. 
uh, and many people have their own uh, version of XFM codes available. So to the best of my knowledge, at the moment, Abacus is the only commercial package that can handle XFM. But it also has certain limitations because uh, it has implemented the part which is more tested. You know, there are some uh, improvements on XFM which has not been implemented in uh, Abacus. Uh, scale boundary, we have, um, our group has implemented a scale boundary in Abacus using user element routines. Uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are no commercially available softwares that can do it. Uh, phase field again, uh, again, it's it's only a fundamental uh, uh, code that you require, so you can use Abacus to do it. You can, uh, you know, the phase field equation can be thought of as a, as a heat equation, so it's a scalar equation, so you can use uh, user elements to uh, use Abacus to solve it. Uh, other than that, I, I'm not aware of any commercial software which can, um, you know, solve, uh, you know, the phase field equation. We can get Comsol to do it uh, because Comsol also works with a couple of problems. Yeah, but other than that, I'm not aware of anything that has a, a ready-made module which can do phase field. Okay, thank you, Sundar. Uh, I would like to thank all the people, all the attendees for their questions and also for being here with us. Uh, Sundar, thank you again for accepting our invitation. Uh, for the people attending the conference, uh, certificates are available if you email uh, to the to the organizers, the email is in the chat, is recov. Uh, dot, uh, no, let me check. You, you have it in the chat and also in the flyer for this presentation. I don't remember where I saw it. Okay, it's investigacion recov uh, at gmail.com. There you can send an email with your uh, name and details and we will provide a certificate for the conference, okay? Uh, we are right on a schedule, uh, Sundar. Uh, I think with this, we will finish the presentation. I don't know if anybody else wants to, to give any feedback or any qu last question uh, before we finish. No, no questions so far. So thank you again. We hope we can collaborate. You have. Uh, uh, Sundar email also she show it in the presentation. You can contact him or contact me to uh, provide uh, further information, propose uh, any collaboration that you want with the IIT in Madras. And we hope that we can, of course, uh, provide more webinars like this. Uh, we already talked with some colleagues from Sundar in, 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 in Madras and we expect them to, to accompany us in the future. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, thank you, Sundar. Thank you. Have Andres. a nice day. Thank you, Andres, and uh, have a nice day. Hope you okay. Bye.